Hello, uh, I'm, I'm back. So, uh, I think uh, last week you, uh, you talked about uh, the wave aspect of, uh, of light. And we will continue in that vein. Uh, we will talk about uh, diffraction and polarization. And this uh, prize-winning photo uh, actually shows both uh, polarization effects as well as diffraction effects. And that's where the pretty colors come from in the reflection of the glasses. As soon as the uh, wave theory of light was, uh, was shown by the uh, young uh, double slit experiment, there was an objection raised by this French fellow. And he said, well, if light is really a wave, then if we have some object and look at the shadow of the object, in the very center of that shadow, there should be a bright spot because it's equally distant from each uh, po uh, portion of the rim. And therefore, we should have a constructive interference at the center. So if, if the particle theory is correct, then of course we see a, a, a normal shadow. But if the wave theory is correct, then in the center of the shadow there has to be light. And clearly that is ridiculous. However, if one does the experiment very carefully for a circular disk like that, and here's an image of it, you actually do find a bright spot in, uh, in the very center, just like the wave theory uh, predicts. And you can use other objects, for example, a razor blade or a single slit that we will talk about. So to discuss a single slit pattern, we use Huygens principle, which says that each portion of a wave front you can consider as the origin of a spherical wave. And then the next wave front is just the envelope of those Huygens waves. So if we have a light beam incident on a slit, then each portion of this slit uh, originates uh, more light waves. And if the uh, light impinging has no angle with respect to the normal, then uh, all of those Huygens waves are in phase and the wave uh, pretty much goes through without uh, destructive interference. So uh, for sine theta, where theta is the angle with respect to the normal, uh, there is a maximum, meaning that there's only constructive interference of all the rays, and there's no phase shift. However, if we tilt, if you look at an angle uh, with respect to the primary beam, viewed from that angle, uh, there is a phase shift between the Huygens uh, waves because this one here has to travel an extra path. And if that extra path is one wavelength, then, uh, then we know that in the center it's half a wavelength. And therefore this ray destructively interferes with that ray. And then the next one up, this one destructively interferes with that one because they have the same phase difference, and this one with that one. And therefore, uh, in this case, where sine theta equals lambda over d, uh, we get destructive interference that is complete, so we actually get a, a dark spot. So if we look at, an, uh, at a larger angle still, then let's say the maximum phase shift is three halves uh, of one wavelength. Then the same thing happens for the uh, bottom two thirds of the slit. So we get destructive interference of those rays at the bottom. It's kind of like uh, making the slit narrow, but the top third survives and therefore there is uh, some light intensity left, although it's going to be fainter than, uh, than the maximum for theta equals zero. If we increase the angle further, then again we get darkness uh, if we have two wavelengths uh, for the maximum phase shift, because again we get pairwise uh, cancellations of, uh, of the individual rays. We can look at the resulting uh, pattern for a single slit and it, uh, it looks uh, roughly like this. So we have a very broad maximum in the center. And the maximum is fairly bright compared to, uh, to the neighboring maxima. 
So this red line is uh, showing the intensity as a function of angle. And you see a smaller maximum on, uh, on either side and the minima uh, in between. And you can now change the uh, slit width. If I make the slit narrow, then this pattern gets, uh, gets wider. And if I make the slit wider, then this pattern gets, uh, gets narrower. Or I can change the wavelength, which right now is approximately green. And if I increase the wavelength, then uh, the pattern gets uh, wider. And if I uh, decrease the wavelength, then it gets narrower. So let's uh, look at the single slit pattern uh, in, in an experiment. You can see the, uh, the bright uh, central maximum here and the uh, smaller and less intense maxima uh, spaced around it. And uh, let's try uh, to do this with a, a different wavelength. So the first wavelength was 532 nanometers. Uh, this is now uh, uh, 650 nanometers, so the wavelength is, uh, is longer. And the slit, uh, of course, is, is unchanged. So now let's try a, a shorter wavelength. Of course, the qualitative pattern is the same as it is before. It is just the spacing between uh, bright spots and dark spots that changes. So let's try a short wavelength. So the short wavelength will be uh, 400 nanometers, uh, almost half of the wavelength that we just saw. Yeah, you can see that the, uh, the, the maximum in this case, uh, the, is, uh, is, uh, the central maximum is, uh, is narrower than it was for the, uh, for, uh, for the red uh, laser light. And you can sort of see the first minimum here. So uh, here I've reproduced the, uh, the intensity pattern as a function of uh, x or uh, this, uh, this beta function, which is uh, defined as the wave number times the diameter times the sine of the angle. And the actual intensity function looks like this, in case you are, uh, you're curious. What you really need to know is that uh, there, there are minima for these conditions, if d times sine times theta equals m times lambda, if m is plus minus 1, 2, or 3, but not 0, because 0 is the central maximum. And then maxima approximately at uh, 3 halves, 5 halves, and so on. And the single slit minima are at the maxima of the uh, young double slit uh, pattern that you uh, uh, were discussing last week. So uh, be careful when applying the, uh, the formula, because for the single slit pattern, uh, this is the condition for, uh, for a minimum, not for a maximum. And uh, unlike for the uh, double slit experiments, where the uh, maxima are equally bright, uh, the central maximum is, uh, is far brighter, and the higher the order of the maximum is, the less uh, bright it's, uh, it's going to be. So let's calculate an example. So let's assume that we have a light of wavelength 750 nanometers, which passes through a slit uh, that is 10 to the minus 3 one, uh, millimeters wide, or 1 micron, or 10 to the minus 6 meters. How wide is the central maximum? In degrees, and how wide is it on a screen that is 20 centimeters away? And to answer that, uh, we look at the condition for minima, and uh, we use the first order minimum because we want to know how wide is the central maximum. And so the first minimum occurs for uh, sine theta equals lambda divided by the, uh, the diameter of the slit. So this is 750 nanometers divided by 1 micron, and that gives us 0.75 or theta equals 48.6 degrees. Now that we have the angle, we can calculate how uh, far is it on the screen. 
And to do that, we observe that uh, this angle, which is roughly 49 degrees, and this is the position on the screen, and this distance is 20 centimeters, and therefore the tangent of this angle is x divided by 20 centimeters. And that means that x is uh, 20 centimeters times the tangent of this angle. But the central maximum is actually 2x wide, because here we just counted from the uh, middle of it to the first minimum. And therefore we get a, a maximum that is 45.4 uh, centimeters wide. So let's look at, a, uh, at another example. Let's assume we have a light shining through a rectangular hole. And that hole is narrower in the vertical direction than, uh, than in the horizontal direction, as shown in the picture. The question is uh, whether you expect the diffraction pattern to be more spread out in the vertical direction or in the horizontal direction. Based on that answer, uh, should a rectangular loudspeaker horn at a stadium be high and narrow or wide and flat? For the answer, we again look at the condition for the first minimum, sine theta equals lambda over d. And that implies that a narrow slit, meaning that d is small, gives a wider pattern, and therefore the, uh, the vertical pattern is wider since the uh, uh, vertical uh, slit diameter is, is smaller. For a loudspeaker, we want uh, the pattern to be as wide as possible so that uh, ev everybody in the stadium can hear it, and therefore we want a horn that is high and narrow, so uh, exactly the opposite as in this picture since the audience is, uh, is located horizontally. So one can apply a diffraction theory to find out the limits of resolution in, uh, in various optical instruments. Almost any optical instrument has a circular aperture of diameter d. And so let's, uh, let's do another experiment and instead of illuminating a single slit, let's illuminate a pinhole uh, with the lasers. And what you see for the, uh, for the pinhole is, uh, is a similar pattern, only now it's circular. So we have a, a bright central maximum that is twice as wide as the interference rings uh, that uh, surround it. And this is called an airy disk after a person named Airy. And such airy disks are actually what appears in the focal plane of an imaging lens, for example instead of simple dots as we had assumed in uh, geometrical optics. So in that case, the, uh, the intensity as a function of, uh, of x, where x is now kd over 2, where d is the diameter of the, uh, of the circular aperture, times sine theta. And we can plot the, uh, the pattern as well, and it looks like that. And the central maximum is even brighter compared to the first uh, neighboring maximum. And in this case, the intensity function, in case you're interested, actually involves the first uh, Bessel function. The first minimum, therefore, we don't have as nice a condition for minima any, uh, anymore. Uh, those minima occur at uneven uh, numbers in lambda over d. And the very first one is 1.22 times uh, lambda over d. And so uh, Rayleigh formulated a criterion what, uh, about the resolution limit of an uh, optical instrument. He says uh, two images can be distinguished if, uh, if the maximum of the second is at the first minimum of the first. So if um, maximum overlaps uh, minimum. And we can look at a picture of uh, the airy disks. Here we have a single image. And here we have a, a, a double image uh, separated by the Rayleigh criterion. And you see you really can't uh, get any closer because uh, uh, you're not going to see anything sharp anymore. Or if we look at it schematically, it looks roughly like this. So we have uh, one object here, and uh, uh, another object here. The first object makes an uh, diffraction pattern here, the second one makes one here, and we overlap uh, one maximum with the uh, first minimum of the other. So we can apply this criterion to uh, telescopes or microscopes. 
we define in the case of a, uh, of a microscope, uh, we also define the resolving power, or RP or S, which is simply the angular separation from the Rayleigh criterion uh, multiplied with the focal length. And S is the shortest distance between two objects uh, that can be resolved. And the assumption is, is that the object is roughly located at, uh, at infinity, so far away from the, uh, uh, from the instrument. Now, the focal length of a lens can't be much smaller than its radius of curvature. Otherwise, we won't have a thin lens anymore. So we can also see that from the lens maker's equation. So at, at the very best resolving power we get for the short, shortest focal length compared to the uh, diameter. And so that one is uh, roughly the diameter divided by two. So we get as the shortest, as the best resolving power, we get uh, roughly the wavelength divided by two, independent of the uh, quality of the instrument. So this is the limiting case. You can't make an instrument that, that does better than that. There is sort of one exception to that, uh, to that rule, and I think you were introduced to it uh, last week. Uh, this uh, LIGO apparatus is attempting to resolve uh, distances of 10 to the minus 15 meters using optical uh, light. And you can do that if you do it statistically with, uh, with high enough light intensity. But it's a he heroic effort to do that. So your usual instrument is limited uh, to wavelength divided by 2. So let's consider an example. Let's look at the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope is a reflecting telescope uh, that was put in orbit above the Earth's atmosphere because uh, typically Earth-bound telescopes are limited by uh, air movements in their resolution. The ob objective diameter of Hubble is 2.4 meters. And uh, the question is, for visible light, for example, 550 nanometers or green, estimate the improvement in resolution over earthbound telescopes if we assume that the uh, air motion limits earthbound telescopes to about one half arc second. 60 arc seconds is one arc minute and 60 arc minutes is one degree. So uh, in other words, half an arc second is uh, one over 7,200 uh, of a degree. Half an arc second is one over uh, 7,200 in degrees. So we can therefore calculate the angle in radians. Uh, we simply take uh, 1 over 7,200 of a degree times pi over 180 degrees, which gives us 2.42 times 10 to the minus 6 radians. And for uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we uh, simply use the uh, Rayleigh criterion uh, to get the resolution there. And if we use 1.22 times 550 nanometers divided by 2.4 meters, which is the objective diameter, then we get 2.8 times 10 to the minus 7 radians. Therefore, we find that the earthbound uh, uh, angle of resolution is, uh, is 8.7 times larger than the Hubble one. So in other words, Hubble is almost nine times better than an earthbound telescope. And that is in spite of the fact that earthbound telescopes usually are larger and have a, a larger ob uh, objective diameter. Let's look at a second example. Uh, and uh, this is looking at the Arecibo uh, radio telescope. If you're ever in Puerto Rico, I recommend checking it out. It's actually quite interesting. So uh, here it is. It's a telescope that is 300 meters in, uh, in diameter. So this radio uh, dish, which is kind of like a, a, a wire network, is reflected on a detector, which is uh, hovering above it here. And we compare uh, this radio telescope in its resolution to the 200-inch uh, uh, telescope on Paloma Mountain here in Southern California. For the Paloma resolution, we have uh, 550 nanometers because it's, the, uh, it's an optical telescope divided by 5.08 meters, the objective diameter, times 1.22, which gives us 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7 radians. And Arecibo has a much larger objective diameter, but radio waves are much longer 
So the shortest wavelength measured with Arecibo is 4 centimeters. And if we plug in the number, we get uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, radians, so much larger than the uh, resolution limit of, uh, of the optical telescope. However, uh, there are other advantages of the larger diameter, and that is you can detect much fainter objects. But it's a problem for radio astronomy uh, that uh, resolution is, uh, is, is harder to achieve. And so in, in general, one uh, combines multiple radio telescopes to get a larger effective diameter. Another instrument whose resolution is limited is, uh, is the human eye. And uh, there are actually not just the Rayleigh criterion that limits it, but there are multiple factors which are of similar magnitude. So first of all, the resolution of the retina is best as at the fovea, and the cone spacings are uh, about three microns there. Then the diameter that we need for the Rayleigh criterion of the uh, pupil varies from uh, 0.1 centimeters to uh, 0.8 centimeters. And if you assume green light, then the uh, uh, Rayleigh limit of resolution is between 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4 radians and 8.4 times 10 to the minus 5 radians. The retina distance is 2 centimeters away from the cornea or the lens. And so if uh, we look at the S, which is the focal length times the, uh, uh, the angular separation, that gives us the uh, distance on the, uh, on the retina of the, uh, of the airy disks uh, from the Rayleigh criterion. And so that comes up to lie between 1.7 micrometers to 13 micrometers. And then there are spherical and chromatic aberrations in, in, uh, in the human eye, and uh, they amount to about 10 micrometers. Uh, so we have uh, 3 micrometers from the separation of cones, we have between 2 and 13 micrometers from the, uh, from the Rayleigh criterion, and we have about 10 micrometers from uh, imperfections in the, uh, in the optics of the eye. So uh, for a rough round number, we can assume that the sum total is roughly 20 micro, uh, micrometers, and that corresponds to 0.5 milliradians in, uh, in angle. And that means that we can separate objects that are one centimeter apart over a distance of 20 meters. So at the near point, we can separate objects that are uh, 0 0.125 millimeters apart. Now if you look at uh, how well do we do with the naked eye compared to uh, what can the best light microscope do, and the best light microscope would use 400 nanometer light, just at the edge of visibility. And that gives us one half the wavelength, gives us uh, 200 nanometers resolving power. And so uh, if we take the ratio of those two numbers, uh, we come up with the best effective magnification of a light microscope uh, of being roughly 600 times. So you can see 600 times better with a uh, microscope uh, compared to the uh, naked eye. And usually microscopes use up to 1,000 times, and that is to reduce eye strain that we don't have to focus on the near point, but uh, can have the eye relaxed. But if you go to bigger magnification, then all you're going to discover is uh, diffraction patterns rather than the object that you, uh, that you want to study. Let's look at an, ex at an example also, uh, one that uh, I uh, could have tried uh, on my way back from Japan. So if you're in an airplane at an altitude of 33,000 feet, which is about 10,000 meters, and you look at the ground, and assuming that you're not over the Pacific Ocean, but uh, over solid ground, uh, estimate the minimum separation that you need between objects so that you can distinguish them. For example, is it possible to count cars in a parking lot? And for the answer, we assume the uh, standard half a milliradian uh, angular resolution of the eye and a distance of 10,000 meters. So we multiply the two, that gives us a, a resolving power of, uh, of five meters. And that means that we can just barely count cars if they are large enough. And uh, just from the diffraction alone for the least dilated pupil, meaning for bright uh, sunlight conditions, 
we get three meters. So we can do a little bit better if we have very good eyes, but uh, we can just barely count cars from such an altitude. Of course, such a question is important for, uh, for animals like uh, eagles that try to distinguish small animals on the ground. Let's now uh, talk about multiple slits. And if you assemble enough of them, it is called a diffraction grating. So, uh, to start this with, let's look at the, uh, this Java applet here for the single slit. And now let's put two slits on there. And let's also make the slits as narrow as possible so that we, get, we actually get the interference patterns of both superimposed on top of each other, which is very complicated. And so rather we uh, make the slit width as, uh, as small as possible. And then we uh, discover, uh, rediscover the uh, Young experiment uh, of narrow slits. And we can, of course, change the uh, slit uh, separation, which then changes the separation of maxima. So now let's uh, look at three slits. And you notice that as I increase the number of slits, uh, the number of the maxima become more and more uh, prominent com compared to the main maxima, compared to the uh, minimum. And they become narrower and narrower. If you have many slits, then basically you have just a, a, a bunch of very, very bright, sharp lines. The way we look at uh, the uh, diffraction grading is, as before, we look at the phase difference between uh, rays that, uh, that are emitted at an angle with respect to the incident beam. And so each neighboring uh, one is, has a path length difference of delta L which is related to the uh, grid spacing D times the uh, sine of, uh, of the angle. And therefore we get a maxima if this path length is an integral number of the wavelengths. So in this case we count zero. So if D sine theta equals m times lambda for m equals zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and so on, the reason why we get such uh, sharp and narrow maxima for a large uh, number of slits, and here I've reproduced some of those, uh, those graphs, for example, for two slits here compared to six slits, is that if we have even a slight mismatch to the integral number of, uh, of lambda, for example, let's say just one thousandth of a wavelength from one uh, ray to the next ray, then if we have 10,000 such slits, then the 5,001st will actually be shifted by half a wavelength. This shift gets uh, multiplied if you compare this one to that one by the number of slits. Therefore, the first ray will uh, destructively interfere with the 5,000th ray, and so on. We have pairwise destructive interference, and we already get a minimum, even if you're just 1,000th of a wavelength off. And therefore, uh, such uh, diffraction gratings are uh, very precise in, uh, in measuring the wavelength of, uh, of, of a wave. And one can make use of that and uh, design a spectrometer or a spectroscope. And of course, one can do a similar thing just with a prism using the dispersion, but uh, diffraction gratings are far more effective. So the way this apparatus works is we have a light source, then we let it pass through a slit, and uh, the slit is located at the focal point of a, of a converging lens, and therefore we generate a parallel light rays or a plane wave impinging on the, uh, on the grating, and then we look at the grating with a telescope, and we measure the angle very precisely, and uh, then we get a, a precise measurement of the corresponding wavelengths. Usually, uh, we can choose uh, the order of the, uh, of the maximum, but usually, for convenience, we just choose the first maximum that is non-trivial. Of course, if you look at uh, theta equals zero, then you always get a maximum independent of wavelengths, so that's not very useful. So usually, one just looks at the first uh, maximum, 
And then if you have two different wavelengths, say 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers, then they don't appear at the same uh, angle anymore because the wavelength is different. And uh, we can therefore separate out uh, those two wavelengths. While at theta equals zero, they superimpose. Or if we have a continuous spectrum, then we see a rainbow pattern uh, for uh, the first, the second, and then the third maximum, and so on. So uh, those are called a spectrum. And that is why this instrument is called spectrometer or spectroscope. So let's look at an example. Let's determine the uh, angular positions of the first and second order maxima for a light of wavelength 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers incident on a grading containing 10,000 lines per centimeter. So uh, to, uh, to answer that question, we first need to find out what is the spacing between uh, neighboring lines. And so we take the 10,000 per centimeter, uh, we take the inverse of that. So 1 over 10,000 per centimeter, and that gives us 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, or 10 to the minus 6 meters, or if you will, uh, 1,000 nanometers. So uh, the, the sine theta of 400 nanometers, uh, we, we, uh, we now use the, the, the formula. Let's look at this one instead. For the 700 nanometers, the first order maximum, we multiply with 1, which is the m. And we have 700 nanometers, and we divide by 10 to the 6 meters, which is the spacing. So this gives us 0 0.7 for uh, 700 nanometers. And for 400 nanometers, we multiply 400 nanometers divided by 10 to the minus 6 meters. And that gives a sine theta of 0.4 in the formula. Then for the second order maxima, for 400 nanometers, uh, we multiply by 2. So this gives us 2 times 400, uh, or 0.8. And for the 700 nanometer case, we get uh, sine theta equals 1.4. And so we observe that sine theta of 1.4 is not satisfied by any angle. Therefore, the second order maximum doesn't exist for the 700 nanometer case. And the first order angles for 400 nanometers is 23.6 degrees and 44.4 .4 degrees for 700 nanometers. And for 400 nanometers, uh, the second order does exist and is at 53.1 degrees. Uh, because the sine would have to be uh, 1.4. Oh, okay. And so there's no angle for which the sine is, uh, is, is 1.4. So eventually, you can't have infinite order uh, maximum because eventually you, uh, you're finished with your 180 degree uh, angle. Let's look at another example. Uh, let's look at a music CD. And if you, if you look at it, you see the colors of a, uh, of a rainbow, and that's typically a sign that there are some uh, interference effects involved. So the question is, we, uh, we uh, estimate the distance between the curved lines that actually uh, contain the music, which are read out by a laser. And the second part of the problem is, uh, is the same, estimate the distance between the lines, but in a different way. Now we note that the CD contains at most about 80 minutes of music and that it rotates its uh, speeds from 200 to 500 revolutions per minute and that only the outermost two-thirds of its uh, six centimeter radius actually contains the lines which contain the music. So for part A, we simply say uh, that uh, the line spacing has to be a few times the wavelength of optical light, which is about uh, 0.5 micrometer. So in other words, the line spacing can be anywhere between 0.5 micrometers to, say, uh, 2 micrometers. For part B, we first calculate the total number of revolutions uh, that happen in, uh, in 80 minutes. So if we take an average speed of 350 revolutions per minute and multiply by 80 minutes, then we get 28,000 uh, revolutions. And that means that there have to be 28,000 lines spread over uh, uh, two-thirds of six centimeters, or four centimeters. 
And the line spacing is therefore 0.04 meters, the 4 centimeters, divided by the uh, number of lines, or 28,000 lines. And that gives us uh, 1.4 uh, micrometer, which is uh, in this reasonable range uh, of the line spacing that we got from part A. So the uh, uh, CD operates close to the uh, diffraction limit when using a, a 650 nanometer laser. And so the, uh, it was quite important when in, uh, in Japan uh, laser diodes were developed uh, that could operate at 400 nanometers, one of which you saw earlier today. That led to the development of the Blu-ray device, which can achieve a larger information density because the wavelength is shorter. So thank you very much.